captivity narratives. I'm going to go up to the top now and you'll see me go into full screen mode here with the slides so that we can take a look at them together. I'm thinking that in your view on your end that one of the things that you might want to do is open this up in notes view and you could type while you're listening to the lecture or you could watch it through one time and then watch it again, type notes separately and then stick it in the PowerPoint or you could do it right in your blog, however you'd like to go about doing that. This painting that you see represented in the first slide is called The Murder of Jane McRae and it's an interesting um, event from early America when Mac Jane McRae was taken by the Indians. It became a sensational tale that was retold not always with accuracy, and there's some accounts of that in the Norton Anthology. There's a breakout section that you can see there on captivity narratives in those intermediary pages that you get that are kind of like booklets inserted in the anthology. Um, I'll apologize right now here at the beginning of this lecture for the sound quality. I left my headset at my office on campus and I'm making this from home, so you might catch some noises like creaking chairs, cats in the background, and so forth. The word captivity comes from the Latin capere, to take. And captivus, the captive, one who's taken and then by implication is held. So captivity, the idea is that somebody's being hold, held, of course, with um, without their permission. And from the experience and from the stories of captivity, there are quite a number of fantasies that develop from it. And that might seem an odd word to apply, but if you take a look at the painting that you see on your screen there now, I think you can understand some of the elements of fantasy involved. I mean, you have here romantic art. Look at the, the way that you have the breasts of, the, of Jane McRae glowing. You have her in this pose. Um, really classical art motifs going here. If any of you know about art history, you'll you'll be able to see a lot of things in the poses that relate back to classical Greek and Roman art, even from the stance of the way the Native Americans are portrayed. There's also an implication of sexuality here that you'll see, but as I mentioned in class yesterday, there was, there is no evidence of rape by American Indians from any of these captures because they did not find the white women appealing. So when you look at this, you have an idea of the way the white people would have thought of captivity, but it doesn't really portray the way that the American Indians would have thought of it. There are many different types of captivity. You have literal captivity by Indians or others. So, you know, the, the taking of the captain, the ke captive, the, the keeping of the captive. So the literal captivity. You have spiritual captivity as something that's metaphorical. Spiritual captivity is something that we've already had a glimpse of with the different texts that, that we've been looking at. The idea of being held captive by your spirituality, by your love of God, by your feelings of needing to be pious. So we have the literal captivity, the spiritual captivity. A third type of captivity is by the imagination, being held captive by your imagination, by reading. A fourth type of captivity would be sexual captivity by seduction, being held captive by your seductive feelings, your sexual feelings, your emotional feelings for someone. A fifth type of captivity is racial bondage. Racial bondage, such as slavery of Indians and Africans in America. So racial captivities. The sixth type is sensibility. Sensibility is a term that you'll probably hear in a British literature class. It's the type of captivity being held captive and bound by one's feelings. 
In early America, the term captivated would have been used often as a synonym for being mesmerized by magic. The thing about it is the term mesmerized wasn't, a, you don't have to copy this part down, it's just trivia here for you, but mesmerized came about from a man named Mesmer that popularized and maybe even invented, that, that would be hard to prove, hypnotism. So the word mesmerized actually comes about a little bit later than this time period that we're in right now. Captivity also relates to the concept of captive Israel that we've talked about in class with the idea of America as a new Canaan, a promised land. And with that, we get ideas of the wilderness as a space where captivity happens. So the wilderness, not just as an actual space, but as a, a symbolic space in early America, the space where the devil might live, the space where there might be certain freedoms and opportunities not in the towns and the cities. We end up with an overarching idea of savagery and civilization in opposition. So you might phrase that as savagery versus civilization. So I'm going to run down those six types of captivity that I just talked about. Literal captivity, like being taken captive by Indians or others, or uh, maybe the idea of being um, held in bondage of some sort. Number two, spiritual captivity. Three, held captive by the imagination, such as by reading. Four, sexual captivity by seduction. Five, racial bondage as captivity, such as the slavery of Indians or Africans in America. And six, sensibility, being bound by one's feelings. Even today, well, this, is, this isn't right now, right now, but this is fairly recent. If you, if you want to pause the video and go and Google this book, you might get a little bit of information on how the captivity narrative is still very much around. This is not the only way, but towards the end of the lecture, I will come back to a way that captivity narratives are still very popular. In this case, this uh, Follow the River book was a pretty big bestseller and it's good. I've read it. It emphasizes the salacious and fantastic and terrible parts of the drama that would happen with the actual taking of the captives, the, the killings, the murders, the violence, in a way that you don't see in the captivity narratives that were written by the actual early Americans who were involved. There are a number of reasons for that that we'll get at a little bit later on. But if you want to pause it and go look this up on YouTube, there is a trailer from a Hallmark Hall of Fame movie that was made based on this book. And I think you'll get a real kick out of it because it is like quintessential, I think it's early 1980s or mid 80s, total cheese ball TV movie fare. And you might get something out of it as far as wanting to write about it on your blog. Maybe you can post that video up if you're interested in it because I'm, in, I'm interested in trying to figure out what are the anxieties portrayed in it that would have ap appealed to an American audience even in the, in, in the time when that Hallmark Hall of Fame movie came out? Why is it still appealing to look at the American Indians as some sort of racialized other? The captivity of Mary Rowlandson takes place during King Philip's War. I don't want to go into a huge amount of details about this because it's something you can readily look up. I'm a big fan of using what we have available to us. In other words, the great encyclopedia in the sky, the internet. 
and of looking primarily at sites with a .edu so that you know you're getting something hosted from a college or university. So the .edu sites are particularly good. A few things about this war that I do want to mention um, that what Mary Rowlandson doesn't tell you is the raid at Lan Lancaster that she was involved in where she was taken was part of retribution by the Narragansett Indians. So it was, it was revenge for a massacre that the whites had done of more than 600 people in an Indian town. So the British had set wigwams on fire. They burned families and um, children to death in the wigwams. And so this capture of Mary Rowlandson was in part revenge for that. This is also part of the French and Indian Wars in early America. And there was a fear on the part of the Puritans of the French as Catholics. So there's a, there's a religious aspect of the French and Indian War that you shouldn't overlook. In this war over 2,600 colonials were captured or killed. About 1,200 homes were burned. A lot of food was destroyed. About 8,000 head of cattle were lost. So it was a devastating war in the colonies. The Oh, I should go back and just tell you what this is. I found this image doing a Google search and I was fascinated by it because it's a board game involving King Philip's War. So I just thought that was really odd. So I popped it up there. This is a more traditional type of image that you would see with a code of the colonies and so forth where this war happened. This war was between the Algonquin speaking Indian tribes and the English in the colonies in New England. So it didn't involve the Dutch in New York. Over half the towns in New England were involved. If you did it by ratio, about one in 20 people were killed in this war. So that's white and Indian both together. And you're looking at about the deaths of 3,000 American Indians. What were they fighting over? Well, I, I mentioned the, the religious aspect of the French and Indian Wars with the French being Catholic. They were fighting over land, which is probably no surprise knowing the history of America. Devastation of Indian cornfields by livestock. So you'd have the livestock, the cattle brought in. This is why so many cattle were killed for trampling their fields. The bullying of the Indians to keep pushing them out of the, the fields that they wanted to take over. Humiliation of the Indian king, Metacomet, who was called by the colonists King Philip. I don't know how they got that out of Metacomet, but they did somehow. And that's why it's called King Philip's War. So there were growing tensions. And in this war, captives were taken. And I think some of the reasons might be surprising and interesting to you. You have trade as part of the reasons that captives were taken. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to take this and, and I'm going to use this captive now as a bargaining chip. Enslavement, basically to use the captive for labor in the Indian tribes and revenge, but also, and here's where it's surprising, adoption. Indians would commonly take white children in particular to replace lost family or tribe members that had perished by disease or in the war. So you have trade, enslavement, revenge, ransom money, and then adoption, the surprising one. And that's because your Native Americans at the time did not have the same cultural construct of racial purity as Europeans. It didn't bother them to take white people in 
and then have them as part of their families. As far as statistics go, between 1675 and 1763, there were approximately 1,600 captives taken. So about 1,600 captives taken between 1675 and 17, 1763. So it was a real possibility. The population was low in the areas this was happening in. Um, typically, men and young children were often killed in attacks. Forced marches killed many of them, like what you see happen to Mary Rowlandson's child along the way. This is a kind of a crude drawing that um, was done around the time of Mary Rowlandson's capture. You'd see the woman there wielding some sort of um, weapon. It's hard to tell exactly what it is there. This is the first narrative by a woman in America. It was a generation before Anne Bradstreet, so we did go a little bit out of order. It stayed in print well into the 18th century. It was a phenomenal bestseller, partly because of the exotic nature of the events that she's telling. And it had a tremendous influence on later captivity narratives. Like Anne Bradstreet, Mary Rowlandson was born in England. She was educated. She married a Calvinist minister, and that had a great amount of influence on the publication of this captivity narrative. At the time, literacy for women, about 40% were able to write. As far as the men, about 60% of men were able to write. And the number of men and women who were able to read was slightly higher. So more could read than could write. So we're looking at about 40% who could write. About 60% of men were able to write, just to give you some context for what you're, what you're reading and how. It was, a you know, I, that's close enough to say about 50-50 on whether or not somebody was able to write or read around this time period in early America. Mary Rollinson was able to speak Algonquin, so she knew the American Indian language. She would have known and recognized some of the Indians who captured her, and they would have likewise known who she was when they took her. And they took her because she was a powerful woman from her status. In the capture she was involved in, It lasted, and you have some of this context probably for in your anthology too, but 11 weeks and five days. And she wrote it two years later. So I want you to think about that two years after. So the, the facts, you know, we've been talking a little bit about the blur between facts and, and fiction and fiction and nonfiction in the class. Keep it in mind she wrote it two years later. The text was first published in America and then in London, which was interesting at the time to have it come out in America first. It's an international story. Usually women were writing private documents. You know already that, that it wasn't typical to have documents written by women in, in, in the public sphere, just from what we talked about with Anne Bradstreet. There's some gender differences in men and women's captivity narratives. The gender differences you have Men's captivity narratives highlighting action and escape and adventure, typically. Action, adventure, and escape in the men's captivity narratives. Women's usually would emphasize pass passivity and distress. So passivity and distress. There weren't very many printing presses in America. So this came out because there was an agenda. A minister who was very prominent, his name was Increase Mather. Don't you love his first name, Increase? Increase Mather wanted to print this because we were on the second generation of Puritans in America at the time. So your first, your first Puritans were dead. The ones who came, the Mayflower, etc., they were dead. The church was falling off. Um, attendance was down. There's an aspect of propaganda to this that might make sense to you now that you've read it, where you have the membership in the church dropping, the tale of distress to show how God could save someone who was pious. There's a spiritual agenda here. And the introduction to it shows how 
there's a, a propagandist purpose to this. And if you look, I think it's here in the frontispiece. This is called a frontispiece in a book. I'm not sure. Let me see if it's in here or not. Um, it's probably on the next page. There's a there's an introduction with Increase Mather promoting this book overtly. Don't read it literally. It's an edited text, very much an edited text. So the parts that you find in there that might not sound right or don't stick right with you, think about it as heavily edited. Think about Mary Rowlandson as having a double voice, the same way that you have in, in Bradstreet. Try to think about when you see her real personality, whatever we can try to discern from a text like this, versus something that seems more constructed. What parts appear to be written more for the public? What parts appear to be written more for the private? So keep working that public-private duality as you're reading. This text has elements of a Jeremiah. Now, I know I'm moving fast through this, so you can pause it at any time during the lecture. It's a sermon with three parts. So a Jeremiah, it has these different aspects to it. These three parts are important because you have first the rules, and then how people stray from the rules, and then how people return to the fold. So the idea is there's these rules established in this type of sermon, People go away from it, and then they come back to the fold. So you might want to pause on this. You also can obviously take this directly into your notes. It's a powerful type of sermon used in early America, particularly when they were trying to recruit people back into the church. So you might want to consider this captivity narrative as a Jeremiah. Again, I want to emphasize this was a transatlantic text. This is an anachronistic image. Obviously, if you look closely, you'll see it's a German map from much later. But I just, I like this image because it gives the idea of shipping trade going back and forth. And this book being shipped back and forth, these ideals and ideas in the Jeremiah going back and forth across the Atlantic. This is something um, that I want you to take particular note of. The idea of captivity as a destabilization of identity. This is a vital concept. We're going to start over to the right with the first point. This I'm going to call this, this is the captivity diagram. The captive starts at home. The idea is they're in a state of faith with with they're innocent, they're they're ignorant, they're in a state of slumber. We go down to the bottom, they're captured. They are removed into Satan's snares. And thus they experience some sort of awakening to the evil of the world. The third phase is captivity itself. The trial, the humiliation, and the new reality of being held captive. And then the fourth and final stage of captivity always involves restoration, redemption, being going back into the fold. You can see how this goes along with the Jeremiah and returning into public life. So it's a destabilization of identity because once you've gone through these phases, you can never be who you were at the beginning. And your identity is therefore not fixed, but variable. You can apply this to your own life. When you go through a traumatic event, you're never the same on the backside. A lot of you will know that from your personal experiences. It changes who you are as a person. And what this genre does is it mirrors the anxieties of people of any time. You could write a captivity narrative now, give it the same applications, and you would see the, the hopes, the fears, the anxieties of the people of any time reflected in these different stages. So if you move through them, you could apply something like this not only to Mary Rowlandson, but also to the slave narratives that we're going to read a little bit later on in the class. 
I'm not going to read through all these just for the sake of time and not having this go on for too long. What I'd like you to do is just copy, paste these, um, the ones that you might find useful for your blog post. Um, if you've already done your blog post, then maybe these are things that you could look at in other blogs when you're responding to them and see how you could apply some of these questions there. And um, have a, a discussion of sorts in the comments on other people's blogs, maybe applying some of these questions, so whether in your own or in somebody else's. I want to end with a little bit of contextualization of just comparing this to popular uh, ideas in America today, worldwide experiences, other places that you might see captivity narratives. I talked about how they always mirror the anxieties and fears of people of any time period. So that's why I have this image of alien abduction here, because alien abductions always have the same characteristics of the captivity diagram here. Same thing. Prisoner of war experiences reflect the same aspects. Slave narratives reflect the same aspects. That might also produce something interesting in the writings that you do and the ideas you have about this. What are some of those comparisons? Okay, so be on the lookout for the lecture. I'll get the lecture for tomorrow posted probably around the same time tomorrow morning early in the day. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say about this text and these, lecture, these lectures. Thanks so much, and I'll see you on Tuesday.